In today's video, we're finally going to learn about vectors in Rust. We've been using them quite often, and I keep describing them as mutable arrays, which is an oversimplified explanation. Vectors allow us to store more than one value in a single data structure that puts all the values next to each other in memory. Unlike Python lists, vectors can only store values of the same type. They are quite useful when you have a list of items, such as lines of text in a file or the prices of items in a shopping cart. The data that a vector points to is stored on the heap, which means the amount of data does not need to be known at compile time and can grow or shrink as the program runs. To create a new empty vector, we use the new function. For example, here we'll create v, which will stand for vector, and we will define this to be of type vector of i32, because that will contain i32, and then we'll type in vector new. And we can also debug it to see what it looks like. And we'll pass in v. And of course, this should be a macro. And when we run this, what we should get as an output is an empty pair of square brackets because we have an empty vector here. And creating an empty vector requires you to specify the type because Rust has no information to work on regarding this vector and it needs to know which type to hold ahead of time. But Rust also has a macro for creating vectors, which is very convenient when you want to create a non-empty vector. For example, let's recreate this vector, except this time I'm going to use the vector macro. And inside here, I'll pass in one, two, and three. Then right below that, we can debug, or use my special debug statement, that v is equal to v. And the reason I'm doing this is because if we use debug, it's going to pretty print it and ruin my day. But as you can see, as soon as we run our program, we're going to get our vector back as an output. Up next, let's take a look at how we can modify a vector. And for this example, I'm going to create a mutable vector called numbers. And we need to make this mutable if we want to modify it. And here we will use the vector macro and pass in one, two, or let's just add zero, who cares? Now, if you want to add an element to a vector, you're going to want to use the push method. For example, numbers.push one. And we can do that two more times. So push two and push three. And this will append an element to the back of this collection. Now, when we debug numbers, what you'll see is that we have all of these numbers in the vector. We were able to add numbers or append numbers after the creation of the vector. Also, just to show you why I'm not using debug, I'm just going to use that real quickly. And when we run this, what you'll notice is that we get this very crazy output, which might be very useful for complex data types. But for this case, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't like it. I don't like the pretty printing. Anyway, going back to what I had earlier, I also want to show you that if you want to remove and return the last element in a vector, you can do so using the pop method. So here we can type in numbers.pop, and this returns an element as well. So if you want to create, let's say popped, you can do that. It's going to both remove the element from the array, if it exists, and return to you the result of that or the optional of that, because if you don't pop anything, then it's probably going to return none. Anyway, as soon as we pop it, we can copy and paste this and rerun our program. And what you'll notice is that we popped three from this vector. Moving on, in Rust, we have two ways to reference a value stored in a vector. And we can do that via indexing or via the get method. So recreating our numbers, which will equal this vector, of one, two, and three. And just to make all that syntax highlighting go away, we're going to push a number. Otherwise, Rust thinks we did this for nothing. And what we're going to do is try to retrieve the element two via indexing. So here we can type in second because that will be the second item of the vector as soon as I can spell it. And that's going to equal a reference of i32. And here we're just going to reference the vector and pass in one. So just like in many programming languages, indexing starts at zero. So if we want to grab the second element, we have to pass in one. Then we can debug this element, which is the second element. And as soon as we run this, you'll notice that we will get two as an output because this is the second element. I'm sorry, this over here is the second element. Now, the other way to retrieve a value is using the get method. So we can create second once again, and this time it's going to be of type option i32, and that's going to equal numbers.get, and here we want to pass in one as the index. So we're pretty much doing the exact same thing we did here, except this time we're returning an optional. Then we need to match second. And since you already know how this works, I'm just going to copy and paste in the two arms, one that handles sum 
which will take second of type i32 and return this print statement, that the second element is second. Now, if there is no value at the index of one, it's going to trigger the none arm and print this statement. So this was the second way we had for referencing a value. And the reason we have these two methods is so we can decide how the program behaves when we access a value that is out of range. For example, we might have some people, which will equal a vector with Bob and James. Now we're going to pretend that we think there's a third element in this vector, such as Sandra. So we will let Sandra equal a reference to people, not a percent, I don't know what that does, at the index of 10. We're just going to pretend that hypothetically, Sandra is supposed to be in here, but for whatever reason, she left the party, so she's not. Right now, if we were to debug or try to use the value of Sandra, what you're going to notice when we run the program is that it's going to panic because the index is out of bounds and it will tell you exactly what went wrong here. The length is two, but the index is 10. We tried to access an index which did not exist. So obviously that led to a panic. Now, if we were to change this to people.get at the index of 10, this would return an option which means that when we run the program, it would not panic. It would either return some value or it would return none, but it would not make our program panic. So that's the difference between the two approaches. Also, one thing to remember is that when the program has a valid reference, the borrow checker enforces ownership and borrowing rules to ensure the reference and any other references to the contents of the vector remain valid. So if you type in let's mute numbers equal a vector of one, two, three, four, and five, and you try to reference the first number. So you type in let first equal a reference to numbers at the index of zero. And then you try to modify the vector by typing in numbers push and six. You're going to notice that Rust will not allow us to use first anymore. If we were to print line that the first element is first, we would get a bunch of syntax highlighting. We need to make sure we use the reference before we attempt to modify it. So to make this work, we'd either have to push before first or after the print statement, then the program would compile. Next, I want to talk about how you can iterate over values in a vector. So in this example, we'll type in let people equal a vector with our favorite friends. I don't know why it took so long to say friends. Maybe I don't have any friends. Bob, James, and Sandra. Now for person in the reference to people, we can print whatever person is at that index. So person, and that's it. Now when we run the program, we should get Bob's, James, and Sandra back. And if we make our vector mutable, we can also apply changes to it as we iterate over it. So maybe we want to do some mathematical computations to a vector of numbers numbers. And here we'll create a vector with one, two, and three. Then for n in the mutable numbers, we're going to dereference n plus equals 10. And all this does is add 10 to each one of these numbers. And the asterisk is used to dereference a variable to get its value. But we will discuss the dereference operator in a future video. For now, just know that we're modifying the original elements. And we can verify that by typing in println, I don't know why I call it printlin. I know it's printline, but in my head, I've always said printlin. I'm going to go back to my debug shortcut so I can just type in numbers. And when we run this, what we should get as an output is that numbers now equal 11, 12, and 13. So vectors are super cool and all, but what if you want them to contain different types? Well, one workaround would be to use enums. So in this example, we're going to create an enum called value. And inside here, I'm going to type in int of type i32, float of type f64, and text of type string, which means that now we can type in let mutable values equal a vector with the following values. The first one is going to be a float which contains pi, which is a constant we can import. And the reason I imported that is because Rust complains when I type in 3.14, it did not like that last time. As you can see, if I hover over it, it yells at me. So I just thought, whatever, I'll just pass in pi. And then we can pass in another value, such as an int that contains the value of 42. I hope you're not complaining about that either. That would be insane if it complained about 42. And right below it, I'm going to push a new value, which will be of type text. 
and that will be a string from Bob. And finally, I want to display the information. So I'll type in debug and pass in the values. And this is not going to work by itself because we are missing a trait. And to see which trait we're missing, we can hover over values. And you'll notice that we are missing the debug trait. So what we're going to do real quick is just type in derive and debug. And now when we run this, what you're going to notice is that we're going to get our values back with the float, the integer, and the string. So why must Rust know what types will be in the vector at compile time? Well, it needs to know exactly how much memory on the heap will be needed to store each element. And that's why we have to be explicit about what types are allowed in the vector.